If we haven't met before, my name is Ashley and I'm the senior pastor here. And like they said, we're in a series called Navigating Relationships. We're looking at God's word for wisdom on all of our earthly relationships. We've been talking about sailing and my husband Jay has been sharing some sailing stories. And there's a lot of nautical principles that also apply to relationships. Unfortunately, we can't do story time with Jay today because he's under the weather. I know I'm sorry. But I do have some super adorable pictures instead. So Jay has been sailing from a young age. Yep, there he is about four years old and our Sun Rider looks a lot like him. Steer in the boat. There's another one, Kennedy Space Center hat, adorable. Aww. I feel like I've been holding out on you guys. Like these pictures are gold. And there is Grandpa Hook, you can see his hook on his uh, left arm then there he was the captain of the ship and he taught Jay everything there was to know about sailing they were good buddies and this picture is so cute uh, Jay is in a car seat in the front of a truck you can tell this is the 80s because it's got like a lap bar there's not even a seat belt and he's just up front it's a wonder that our generation even survived <laughs> so cute the reason that Jay got to go on all of these sailing adventures is because of his relationship with his grandpa. I had grandparents. They never took me sailing. But when I started dating Jay, because of our relationship, he's like, hey, you want to go experience this cool life thing with me? And I'm like, yes. Your relationship with someone determines so much. It determines your opportunities. It determines how you are around them, if you feel comfortable and like you can just relax and be yourself or if you feel a little nervous or uptight. It determines so many things and that's just human relationships. The way you relate to God, that's what we're going to be talking about today, it impacts every other relationship. It impacts every part of your life. You can relate to him in one of two ways. You can choose to be a servant or you can choose to be a son. Tell the person next to you, servants and sons. Servants and sons. And we're going to be using the whiteboard today. If you're taking notes, you can write down servants on one side and sons on the other. And just so you know, this isn't like just a guy thing. So sons means sons and daughters. I just chose it because... It has an S, so it works really good for alliteration. But ladies, this includes you too. We can be servants or we can be sons when we relate to God. And hopefully, you're relating to him as a son because he's a good, good father. Hebrews 3.5 says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, but Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. Moses was a servant but Jesus is a son. Under the law, Moses was told by the God in the burning bush, he's like, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground because servants can only approach God under certain conditions. But under grace, Jesus says in the, par in the story of the prodigal son, he says, my son who was lost is now found. Put some sandals on his feet. He has a right to stand in my presence. Because of Jesus, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence as sons. Being a servant is good, but being a son, that's so much better. It's just so much better, and it's way more fun. When I was a kid, my mom cleaned other people's houses for a living, and so she would go from house to house, and in the summer, she didn't have a babysitter for my sister and I, so she would take us with her, and we thought it was fun. We got to explore other people's houses, because usually they weren't home, you know, just like, ooh, what's over here? This is fun. See how other people live. Uh, we got to watch Gilligan's Island reruns on TV land, because that was the time slot of the day. If you haven't heard of Gilligan's Island, we have a picture for you. I was sharing this with the kids at chapel at our school, and they're like, ain't never heard of Gilligan's Island. Nobody's, nobody's seen that. I was looking up what Gilligan's Island was on the internet on IDMB, and it was saying, 
a surprisingly lasting series. Basically, nobody knows why it was successful, but here we are. So we would watch Gilligan's Island, and then we would also have to be really careful because it wasn't our house. So we'd have to take off our shoes, you know, not get dirt on anything. We could eat snacks, but you don't want to get crumbs on the floor. We could not play with other people's toys. We just had to look at them. So it wasn't that fun. But then we would get to go home, And man, we wore our shoes in the house. We're like, this is our house. This is our place. We were comfortable. We relaxed. We had our own toys. We played with them. We put them wherever we wanted them to because they were ours. Well, I mean, technically, they were mom and dad's because they own everything in our house. But, you know, they felt like they were ours. They let us use them as ours. We enjoyed our relationship with our parents. And when it comes to our relationship with God, we can be servants or we can be sons. And point one today, if you're taking notes, is that servants work and sons rest. Servants work and sons rest. When we went with my mom, we were there to work. But when we were at home, oh man, we just rested and enjoyed our relationship. And that's the two ways of relating to God as well. You can relate to him through your works where you're like, I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to be good enough, God. And I can follow all your commandments, but nobody can do that. The Bible says all of our best efforts are like filthy rags compared to his amazing goodness. So we could live by works, which isn't successful, or we could rest in Jesus's finished work and trust him, trust the work that he's already done. He talked about it in Matthew 11, 28. It says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? That's what happens when you are working. Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. You see, you could be doing lots of works, but if they're from the wrong heart motivation, then you're going to get burnt out. And you could do the same works with a different heart, resting in your identity as a son of God, and you don't get burned out. You're pouring from a different place. Servants, they work in the name of religion, and it's not sustainable. That's not what we were created to do. Servants get burnt out. If you're feeling burnt out in life, could it be that you're operating as a servant? And I'm not just talking about church stuff. I'm talking about in your parenting life, and in your work life, and in your friend life, and all the things that you do that are good things. Are you feeling burnt out? Then it could be a sign that you're living from a place of being a son, or a servant, sorry. But sons, they rest in their relationship with their father. They learn how by spending time with Jesus. He says, walk with me, Also work with me. There's still working happening, but watch how I do it. I'll show you how to do it from an unforced place of rest in relationship with me. Instead of self-effort, you can source your doing for God from being with him. Jesus talks in Matthew 7, 21. He says, what is required is serious obedience, doing what my father wills. I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached the message, we bashed the demons, our super spiritual projects had everyone talking, and you know what I'm going to say? Jesus says, you missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, you can preach, you can do all the Bible studies, you can conquer the demons, but if you're doing it from the wrong heart place. If you're doing it to look good, then you're missing out. I want to know you. And then you serve out of that place. He's saying you could do all the right things. You could pray. You could read your Bible. You can invite people to church. But if you do them because you're supposed to, because you think you have to, because you dread doing them, you're trying to earn something so you look good and you feel guilty when you don't do them, it's a wrong motivation. And you're living like a servant And there's a better way. There's a way of freedom. He says, what I want is a relationship with you as a son. I want to know you. 
Remember when he said, you never knew me. I want to know you. I want to spend time with you. Like I know about you, but I want to relate to you. And out of that secure love relationship, you'll want to do what my father wills. It will be a place where you pour easily because of who you are in Jesus. Sons have full access to God that servants don't have. And he always has time for you. When you need comfort, he's there. When you need guidance, he'll give you direction. Like any good father, he wants to see his kids succeed. And under grace, your heavenly father, he knows what you need even before you ask. He says he'll provide for your needs according to his glorious riches. He wants to give good gifts to his kids and he gives us the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 36, 26, he talks about how I put my spirit in you and that will change your heart. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I'll put my spirit in you so you'll follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Just choked on some air. Does that ever happen to you? He loves us unconditionally. And as we receive that love, it makes us whole. And as we take away lies and mindsets that stopped us from receiving as a son, he heals our broken places. He literally changes our hearts as we surrender to him. And when you're whole with Jesus, then you love people because it's an overflow. All those needs that you have, they feel secure in him. And you're like, I have love to give away. And I know this isn't me, it's gotta be God. Point two today is that servants wait for orders and sons have ownership. So servants wait for orders and sons have ownership. My mom, when she would go to people's houses, they would leave her a list of what they wanted done. You know, they're like, we need the floors done today and the bathrooms. Oh, you can do the laundry too. And she'd just do what's on the list because she was a servant. You know, servants don't know their father's heart. They don't know what should be done. But my sister and I, we're sons and daughters. We're like, hey, when we go to our house, we know exactly what our parents want us to do because we live there. We have ownership. We're like, if I make a mess, I'm going to clean it up. This is my house. I have pride of ownership. I want my room to look nice. A servant doesn't know his master's will. He has to be told what to do. But sons, they just see what their father does. When our son Ryder was two, I have this video I want to show you where he was the last person at the table eating his dinner. Two-year-olds eat really slow. My husband's doing the dishes, and I'm just talking to Ryder, asking him about eating dinner. And we didn't have to tell him, oh, you've got to eat your food. He's saying, I want to eat so I can be big like Daddy. I don't want to eat my dinner so I can be big and strong and one day have some tools like Daddy. Check it out. I'm not strong boy yet. I'm not big like daddy. I'm not big like daddy though. You're not big like daddy? No. Do you want to be? Yeah. I'm too big, but I'm big and strong. Big and strong, like okay. daddy. Yeah, I can get big like you so I can get big, big. Okay. Like you. So I can eat that all my cake and I can, um, I can get big like you. Okay. What will you do when you're big? And even at two years old, he's like, I see my father. I see what he does. I see who he is. And I want to be like him. And sometimes we complicate this whole sonship thing. But it's as simple as spending time with our dad and learning from him. What Ryder did, it came out of relationship, just spending time with his daddy. It's like a son who owns the family business versus someone that you hire to work there. Like if your family owned a gym and one of the equipment things broke, like a treadmill broke, if you're the son of the house, if it's your family business, you're like, oh man, we got to get the company on the phone. Every time this machine isn't working, we're losing money. You got ownership. 
But if you're a servant, you're like, all right, let me write up an out of order sign, get some tape, just put it right on there. It's out of order, so sorry. Because you don't have ownership. The difference between a son or a servant. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And he gave the whole earth to us. In the Garden of Eden, he said, rule and reign and take dominion and be fruitful and multiply. And we lost our dominion for a little bit there. We gave it up to the enemy. But Jesus got it back at the cross. And he gives it to us. And so we have authority. Come on. And God says we're in charge of his whole world, his whole earth. And so we have extreme ownership because we're like, this is my father's. Whether it's here at church or at work or at your house or walking down the street. It's like, this is my father's world. I'm his son. I represent him. But if you're a servant, you're going to put a limit on what you do. You're going to be like, God, I'll do anything but not that one thing. God, please don't make me step out of my comfort zone. Don't ask me to talk to that person. I'll do anything but that. Servants do what's required. But sons, they take ridiculous responsibility wherever they go because they're like, everything is God's. And I'm representing his family. I have ownership. King David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house, God, than spend my time partying it up. Now, he's a king. He's got lots of things to do, but he's like, I want to be in your house. For me and my house, we say yes to whatever God asks us to do, whether it's out and about or it's here at church. Even before we were ever on a staff at any church, there was a period where I did drywall at a church. I don't know how to do drywall. They're like, hey, we need some help. I'm like, cool. I'm your person. I just say yes. Show me what to do, you know? A few years ago here at our Nerf camp, we had a kid throw up. You know, Nerf camp gets intense, and they're, like, running around and just throw up in the middle of the foyer. And I look around, and I'm the only mom here. So I'm like, you know what? I'll clean up the puke because it's like it doesn't matter what I'm doing. It's important if it's for my father. It's not about me. My father has changed my heart, and so I care about people. I love our team so much, our volunteers, because they choose to be about their father's business. We get people on teams where they are gifted and passionate and excited, but at the end of the day, they're like, hey, I don't care what the position is. I don't care what the title is. Let me just serve my dad. Come on, I want to build his church. It's the most important thing we can do. And not just here at church, it's anywhere they go. They take what God is doing here to their world because they're sons and they love people. Servants, they're about themselves. When they meet new people, they build their own temporary kingdom. They draw people to themselves because they're like, I'm not secure. I'm looking for love. And so they build that. But sons, they're like, I'm secure in my identity. I'm already loved. If I meet you at work and you're like, wow, you're awesome. I want to be like you. I want to hang out with you. That's great. But I want to invite you to my church because I'm building my father's kingdom. And everything good that you see in me is because of him. And I want you to experience that too. Sons bind people to God's house. Servants say, your church or the leadership. When you guys are greeting me at the door, sometimes what people will be like, your church is so nice. No, no, sons, it's our church. It's our father's house. It's not mine. It's all of ours. Jesus told a story about two sons, the prodigal son. So there's this one son, he's like, hey, father, give me my inheritance. You know, I I'm not going to wait till you're dead. I just wish you were gone now. Give me half your estate. And the father's like, okay, here you go. And the son goes off and he's living it up and partying and wasting the money. And finally he comes to the end of all of it and he finds himself next to some pigs eating what they eat. And he's like, man, I would rather be a servant in my father's house than do what I'm doing now. And so he goes back to his dad. He has this whole speech prepared and his father says, no, 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 no. My son was lost and now he's found. He's back. Let's celebrate. I'm not going to make you a servant in my house. You are restored as a son. No matter what you've done, I love you. I've always loved you. He had an older brother who stayed in the house, 
who was doing all the right things for the father. He never left him. He never took his inheritance. And when he heard about his younger brother coming home, you'd think he'd be excited. But he was not. He was mad. Luke 15, 28, the older brother became angry. He refused to go into the party. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. He's a son. But he says, I've been slaving for you, father. I've been taking orders from you. He's acting like a servant. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, see what language he's using there? Not our brother, not our family, but this son of yours, he's speaking like a servant, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And I love what the father does. He says, my son. This guy's like, I'm a servant. I've got servant mindsets. Servant, servant, servant. And the father, first thing he does is point to his identity and say, no, you are my son. And that word there, son, is different than any other place in the story. The rest of the story, it meant offspring. But this one is beloved son of the father. It's his identity. When you know who you are, it changes everything. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened up and God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And that was before Jesus did any miracles, anything cool. He was just affirming his identity. And he says the same thing here. My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Because you're my son, it's always been yours. You could have had a goat with your friends. You could have killed a fattened calf. It's always been yours and I've always been with you you don't have to earn anything the older brother he spent his whole life missing out because of what he believed about himself nothing that the father said but his own mindsets people of hope could it be that some of us have been missing out because we see ourselves as servants but God says you are my sons and daughters you can change your mindset today there is not condemnation just freedom there's another story in Genesis 9. Noah is there after the great flood. He's planted a vineyard and he's made some wine and he drank the wine and he drank too much wine and he got drunk. And then it says he got naked. I don't know why. Maybe it's really hot in the desert. He was inebriated, so it seemed like a good idea at the time. So he's passed out and he's naked. And his son Ham walks in and he sees his nakedness. He's like, oh. I'm going to go tell my brothers about this. This is funny. But the word foretold there is he uncovered and exposed something that shouldn't have been revealed. He's probably laughing about it. You know, not taking it too seriously. It's just dad naked. Genesis 9:23. Shem and Japheth, they took a cloak. They held it between them from their shoulders. They walked backward and covered their father's nakedness, keeping their faces turned away so they did not see their father's exposed body. When Noah's other two sons heard about his nakedness, they didn't make fun of him. They're like, no, no, no. Our father is part of our family. His reputation is our reputation. If we're making fun of him, we're making fun of ourselves. You know, Noah, he made the mistake of getting drunk and naked. But that doesn't mean that they had to respond in the same kind of way. They responded with honor. They said, we will not look upon our father that way. We will not mock him. In fact, we will cover him. And while we're covering him, we're going to do it in an honoring way. Because sons take ownership. And not only do sons honor their father's house, they defend it. Jesus talked about it. John 10, 11, he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd, and he does not own the sheep. He's not a son. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and it scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand. He's a servant. He doesn't care about the sheep. A servant runs away when trouble comes because he's like, I don't have ownership. This is above my pay grade. He's just there on orders. But a son, like Jesus, he says, you're going to have to go through me 
to get to my father's sheep because I love him and I love them. He says to Peter, if you love me, take care of my lambs. He's changed our hearts as son to love his people. When you know Jesus, he changes you from the inside out. I'm oh, sad to say it, but Christians in general, we're not the best at this. And I don't want to step on your toes today, but I think it's important to say I found that we're probably the first people to criticize God's house, to repeat what we've heard about other churches, question people's motives. You know, I've never heard a lost person complain about a church. The enemy loves when we do this because a house divided against itself cannot stand. You've probably got church hurts if you've been in any church for any period of time. I've been hurt by church people. Raise your hand if you've been hurt by somebody in a church. Almost all of us. If you haven't, we're not perfect. We might hurt you one day. I'm sorry. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've been hurt by somebody at work. Almost all of us. Raise your hand if you've been hurt by somebody in school, in a classroom setting ever in your life. Yes, we're dealing with humanity. Come on, we're created in the image of God. Yes, we're being transformed. Yes, but we're still human. And so when churches, you know, when people in churches hurt people, we want to be careful not to criticize the church because the church is our father's house. Now, the church where I came from, I pray for them every day because they're building God's kingdom. And I cheer them on and I encourage people in that region to go there because they're preaching that Jesus is the way. And any church that's preaching that, we are all on the same team. We're all part of the same house. Come on. Now listen, I don't go there anymore. It wasn't the right fit for me. So sometimes there are situations and things you need to work through because there's no perfect people. But man, this is your father's house. So when I see someone complaining about another church or when I see someone posting on social media, about a church, first thing I think is, this is my father's house you're talking about. As a son of the house, I cannot participate in that. I think, did God give you the position of authority for that church? Do you have to give an account for it? Do you trust God to do what he said he would do? If it's of human origin, it will fail. That's what Acts says. But if it's of God, it will be unstoppable, and you'll find yourself fighting against God. And second of all, I love people too much to let them hurt themselves. I don't want them to be like our brother Ham who was complaining about dad. No, 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 no. If somebody's doing that, I want to talk to them and say, hold on, hold on. That's our father's house that you're talking about. As for this house, we will always uplift other churches. Come on. Because when the tide rises, it lifts all the boats. And if you're ever here on Tuesdays for prayer from 7 to 8 a.m., anyone's invited, you'll see us praying for other churches because it's all our Father's kingdom. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. Point three, servants come fully grown and sons are growing. Servants are fully grown. But sons, they're growing in their Father's house. And what do I mean by this? Fully grown is when we know it all, we can't ask for help, we don't ask for accountability, we're like the Pharisees. But growing is like, hey, I don't know everything. I'm always being changed by my Father. Jesus told another parable, Matthew 21, 28, tell me what you think of this story. A man had two sons. He went up to the first and he asked, son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. The son answered, no, I don't want to. Later on, he thought better of it and went. So son number one, he's like, Dad, I gotta be honest with you. In my humanity, I don't wanna do this. We can be honest with our father. But then he thinks about it and he's like, if my father is asking me to do this, then he probably has a reason. So you know what, I'm gonna change my mind. I'm gonna be willing to be a growing person and I'm gonna go do what my father asked. Verse 30, the father gave the same command to the second son. He answered, sure, I'd be glad to. It's the right answer. But he never went. So he's a good attitude, but he's lying. He's saying, sure, dad, I'll do it. <laughs> no. Doing the right thing 
with the wrong motives. He didn't do it. Verse 31, which of the two sons did what the father asked? They said, the first, of course. Jesus said, yes, and I tell you that crooks and whores are going to precede you into God's kingdom. John came to you showing the right road. You turned up your noses at him, but the crooks and whores believed him. Even when you saw their changed lives, you didn't care enough to change and believe him. He's saying to the Pharisees, you're fully grown. You know everything. You put on a facade. The outside of the cup looks good. You can't be real with anybody. But sons, they're always growing. The older they get, the more they're like, hey, I've got more things to learn. The more they learn, the more they receive grace. They're vulnerable. They're secure in their identity because they're loved by the Father. And they welcome correction and conflict because they're like, Thank you. It helps me to grow. It's better to be a son who's growing than a full-grown servant. This past week, we had over 200 adults, teens, and kids at family night on Wednesday night. Come on. And I love that because it's sons growing in their father's house. It's people saying, I am hungry to grow. I am hungry to experience all that God has for me. I'm hungry to be changed by him. And we actually have some photos from family night. If you couldn't make it, you could come again in two weeks. It's every second and fourth Wednesday of the month from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Do we have those photos of family night or did we already? Oh, there we go. Look so happy. We're all at tables together, just learning from one another, talking about what God is doing in our lives, encouraging each other, experiencing community, doing life together. It's so much fun. Make sure you register at nyhopechurch.com if you have not been to Family Night yet so we can fast track you when you do come. All right, last point for today, number four. Servants are temporary, sons are eternal. Servants are temporary. Temporary. And sons are eternal. You know, my mom, she would have contracts for a season, and then people would move out of the area, or their finances would change, and her contract would be over. It was a temporary thing. But my identity with her, I was always her daughter. It didn't change no matter what the circumstances. And it's the same way with God. When we're sons, it's an eternal choice, eternal relationship. Servants, it's temporary. It changes based on what we do, if we do this or that, how close we feel to God. But when you're a son, he is always close to you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And before Jesus, we only had the opportunity to be servants like Moses. We couldn't approach him as sons because we had a sin wound and it caused eternal death. And that's why he hates sin, because it separates us from him. And priests could offer sacrifices for our sins. They'd offer animals. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's not forgiveness for sins. So they would offer animals, and that would last a year. And then we'd have to come back and offer some more animals. And it would get us focused on ourselves and our behavior. And it was a temporary fix. But God sent Jesus, fully God and fully man, an eternal solution for an eternal problem. And Jesus did what we could never do. Hebrews 10, no matter how many sacrifices were offered year after year, they never added up to a complete solution. If they had, the worshipers would have gone blissfully on their way, no longer dragged down by their sins. They feel free. But instead of removing awareness of sin, when those animal sacrifices were repeated over and over, they actually heightened awareness and guilt. The plain fact is that bull and goat blood can't get rid of sin. Verse 10. We are made fit for God by the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Come on, Jesus died once and for all. God loved the world so much that he sent his son, Jesus, that whoever believes also can become a son or a daughter. They can rest in that relationship with him. They don't have to wonder, does he love me? He loves me not. No, 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 you can rest in the closeness of that relationship. You can have peace with him. You have ownership in that everything is the Lord's and you're one of his kids, you're part of his family. Sons are always growing and what they have with God is eternal. It's here and now 
but at last beyond this life, beyond this world.